Welcome to the worship of our Lord as we gather together to celebrate the third Sunday of Easter. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We're so thankful for those of you worshiping with us in person and those of us joining us online. I invite you to please rise as together we gather around the baptismal font, remembering that in the waters of baptism, God names and claims each one of us, precious child, and gives us the gift of the forgiveness of sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you the whole for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join in singing. <laughs>
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Eternal and all merciful God, with all the angels and all the saints, we laud your majesty and might. By the resurrection of your Son, show yourself to us and inspire us to follow Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. The first reading is from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 6 and 7 through 20. It can be found in your pew Bible on page 97 of the New Testament. Saul, later called Paul, was an ardent persecutor of all who followed the way of Christ. This reading recounts the story of his transformation, beginning with an encounter with Jesus Christ on the way to Damascus. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice, but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen a vision, a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many men about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. 
But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before the Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Here ends the first reading. The second reading is from Revelation, chapter 5, verses 11 through 14, can be found in page 195 of the New Testament. The vision of John recorded in Revelation offers a glimpse of cosmic worship around the throne. At its center is the lamb who was slain. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels surrounded, surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice, worthy is the lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might, and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing, to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. The word of the Lord. Right, all the children come forward, come on up. We got a couple here. Isaac and Willow, come on up. Okay, have a seat. <clears throat> How are you two today? Good? Okay. Oh, three. Okay, Calvin. Come on up. Okay, make three. Good number, okay? So I brought something with me. Oh, because it amazes me this time of year. What amazes me is that God can take something like this. What does this look like? A bad onion? onion? Kind of like a bad onion, yeah. Uh, What else? What else does it look like? Does it look like it can do much of anything? No, no. no. It's kind of worthless, right? I mean, it's edible. It's edible. Oh, okay. It's not edible. So I need to make sure that I put a disclaimer. This is not edible. But guess what? Uh, What amazes me this time of year is that God can take something like this. This is actually a bulb, okay? This is a bulb. God can take something like this and turn it into something like this, okay? Something that looks kind of worthless and like it's not going to do much. God takes that and makes it into something that blooms, okay? God changes it, okay? God takes this and changes it into something oh, that's oh, very beautiful, okay? And that's what we just heard in the life of Paul. We knew him as Saul, but his name was changed to Paul, and God changed his life, okay? He wasn't a, at the beginning, he wasn't a very nice, man, okay? He wasn't very nice to those who were following Jesus, but God chose to change him into that he became a follower of Jesus and told others about Jesus. And, and so most of our, old, our New Testament are the stories about Paul and how God had changed his life. So uh, what's amazing, I want you to think about, and when you look at spring, there's going to be a lot changing in nature, Oh, hopefully we're going to get a little warmer, right? That's going to change. The weather's going to change. That's going to help us, okay? And that's going to bring about change. But I want you to think about how God changes all things all the time and making them into something new and great, okay? And part of, as you're, hopefully you're doing, oh, 
your Easter eggs, right? You're doing your Easter eggs. And today, one of the things that you are to do, Jesus brings joy to the world. Tell about a time you felt joyful. When was it? What do you think caused you to feel joy? So, so for me, the joy is finding the daffodils all in bloom and seeing everything happening in nature, okay? So I want you to think about what fills you with joy today. Day. Okay? So let's have a word of prayer. Good and gracious God, there are so many things that fill us with joy, that remind us that you are always bringing forth new life. Amen. And you have something to be very joyful about, Kevin. What is it? What are you going to do today? Communion, yes, and that's something new, okay? That's great. That's something, yes, that's something that can fill you with joy today, okay? We celebrate with you, okay? Good. Thank you for being good listeners. <clears throat> I invite the congregation to rise for our Alleluia verse. I was not expecting Julie to be in the pulpit. And I was like, is she preaching today? <laughs> so our gospel for this day, for the third week of Easter, comes from John, the 21st chapter. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, which is the Sea of Galilee. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Canaan and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll go with you. They went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. And Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? And they answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast it. And now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple, whom Jesus loved, said to Peter, It is the Lord. And when Simon heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging net, the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land. They were about a hundred yards off. And when they came ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard, hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, Come, have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus had appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, and my sheep. And he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you, you were used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wish. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. And he said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, 
he said to him, follow me. This is the gospel of our Lord. I invite you to be seated. Well, I don't think many of us like change, do we? We get caught up into our old routines. We like things to stay the same, do we not? Don't rock the boat. Keep the status quo. We hold out for the old, thinking that in some way, it's probably going to stay the same. Well, many of you know that I am an Oldsmobile enthusiast. Since my teenage years, I've actually always driven an Oldsmobile somewhat out of nostalgia for both my grandfather's work uh, at Oldsmobile, and I have found memories going to the, uh, the dye and tool room and, and having lunch with them and being able to wander the factory. And so over the years, I've acquired a few Olds, one of which happens to be a 1984-98 Olds, low mileage, excellent condition, which sits in my garage. It doesn't leave the garage much, which has been really a source of contention with my wife as to why that car gets the garage when her car gets the driveway. My reasoning that I want to preserve the car, which is noble, but in reality, I'm not doing the car any favors, am I? Because through time, it just sits there. It's deteriorating because engines and cars are to be driven. What good are they if you don't use them? Which is my wife's side of the argument. Well, sharing this story on our Wednesday Bible study, one of the participants reminded me of a quote from St. Thomas Aquinas who said, if the highest aim of a captain were to preserve his ship, he would keep it in the port forever. Well, same is true when it comes to our personal lives. I think all of us get advice, do we not, from our doctors that tell us about our physical health. If you don't use it, what? You will lose it, right? If you don't use it, you will lose it. Well. I want us to maybe apply that to our spiritual lives and think about that for a moment. I share this with you because our scriptures for today speak of individuals that don't want things to change. They want to preserve what is. They're all well versed in the status quo and they see all this change that's happening in the world around them and their first line of defense is that the world is to blame. Everything outside that's happening to them. That maybe God has something to say in all of this. Yes, the, the world is changing. That's a given. God is always making things new. But have you ever considered God sometimes changes us? We can commiserate about all the changes taking place in our world, and we can even see God's hand as a part of that change. But do we ever consider? Do we ever consider? the fact that God sometimes changes us. It's so easy for us to see change as outside of ourselves, something being imposed on us because of the world, the, the new age. But do we leave room for God actually to change us? That God is actually working change in us. That's precisely what I want us to think about in light of our scripture for today. Both Saul and Ananias, I would propose that God is working change in both of these individuals. Think for a moment of Saul. We know him as Paul, so I'll refer to him as Paul. The change I see God working in his life is that the church is much bigger than what Paul could ever imagine. He loves the tradition of the church. He's a traditionalist and will go to any degree to preserve it. And how ironic that God informs us that Paul will become God's instrument to include others into the church, especially the Gentiles, those outside of the tradition. Paul's a very religious guy. We know that he is a Jew. He wants to preserve the ways of the temple and the synagogue. He's even branded a persecutor for anyone who wishes to bring something new into the church. But God, 
has stirred things up in the temple by raising up Jesus from the dead. And now there's this small group in the church that are meeting on the side. They're convinced that Jesus was actually the Messiah. Who would have ever thought? And they're beginning to follow his teachings. These people who probably Paul has known for a long time, people who he actually has been worshiping with, and they're stirring up the pot. And so Paul wants to put an end to it. What would happen in the temple if they were to take over? Change, change, change. We don't like it. I think probably if we're honest, we've all had such thoughts, have we not? We don't like change. Don't mess with the hymns. Don't mess with my pew or the time of the service. Don't think about inviting others. I don't do those things. And so Paul goes as far as to get letters from the local religious leaders to round up the rabble-rousers so that he can haul them off to the bishop to stop it once and for all. Well, you see, God stirs things up. Paul has this experience on the road where he's confronted with the Lord, much the same way as Moses was in the burning bush. And when he asks, who are you? When he asks the Lord, who are you? What was the response? Much to his surprise, the reply came back, I am Jesus. Had the phone wires got mixed up? Jesus can't be the Lord God Almighty. It doesn't fit. Something must be wrong was a change that Paul was not ready for. God is God, and Jesus is this guy who was stirring up the pot, which Paul thought had been put in his place on the cross in Jerusalem. How could it be? Well, I like to think that Paul was not only blinded spiritually, physically, but maybe he was also blinded spiritually. Well, God did change Paul, we know that he had big plans for Paul because you and I are recipients, benefactor of God's plan. God had intended us to be a part of his church. We wouldn't have most of the New Testament if it were not for Paul. His letters are a source of encouragement and strength in our walk of faith, even to this day. And Paul himself speaks of such change that came to his life in Philippians. Circumcised on the eighth day of the race of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrew parentage, in observance of the law of the Pharisees. He was so zealous and so devout that he went persecuting Christians. It was his natural way for him to show his devotion. But little did he know he would become one of the greatest followers of Jesus and Jesus' spokesperson. I believe Paul's change was that he came to understand God so loved the Jew and the Gentile, the male and the female, the slave and the master, and all are beloved in God's sight. And God's church was to be expanded. But the story doesn't end there. There's another life that God is changing, and that's Ananias, who doesn't also like change. He doesn't like changing his mind, how he sees things. And his change has to do with his perception, his preconceived ideas about this kind of man who Paul is. As our reading tells us, he has heard the rumors. The Lord God said, go. For I'm about to bring Paul to your doorstep. Well, I think we've all had situations like Ananias, have we not? Where our prejudices about people, who they are, they seem to be so different. and We don't want to associate with them. Please help me just to avoid them. Yet, like Paul, God stirs the pot a bit for Ananias and tells him, go. Go. Because Ananias is going to be the change agent of healing for Paul. God is going to use Ananias to change Paul's life around. How many times have we said, not me, Lord. I'll do anything, Lord, but not that. Well, God often has other plans. It's interesting. God sometimes chooses. 
To Ananias' reluctance, God said, go. For Paul is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and before the people of Israel. I think the change that is, God is stirring in Ananias is that he needs to maybe confront his own fears. He's fearful of Paul and what he has heard. Yet God brings Paul right to Ananias' doorstep. And the impossible is made possible. And Ananias heals Paul. Which really shouldn't surprise any of us. With God, all things are possible. We might better ask ourselves, what might God be up to in our lives? Is God stirring up in us a change? Well, our gospel today is really another example of God stirring the pot, bringing about change in the lives of the disciples. It's after Jesus, after his trial and persecution, his execution on the cross, his death and burial. And now the disciples perceive as idle tales about Jesus' resurrection, although some have actually seen Jesus. But the disciples, not really embracing this change that's happening in the world around them, the reality of the fact that Christ is risen, what the re resurrection actually means for their lives. In the midst of this change, all they do is return to life as normal. Let's, let's go fishing. Let's go fishing. They turn to what is comfortable. They turn back to old routines. How many times do we say to one another, I just want things to return to normal. Just stay the way the, they used to be. We all say it from time to time. But God has this way of stirring up the pot in ways that we might not fully understand at the time, but in time, God will reveal his plan, his intention, and it's times like this that we learn to actually trust God. Believe the change that's happening in the lives of Jesus' disciples is in them realizing that God has given them gifts and talents to be used. That they might not only go out fishing for fish, but those talents in God's hands can be used for God-given purposes, to fish for people. And so I think like Paul and like Ananias, these disciples They've been downplaying their abilities, their self-esteem that was low. And when they meet Jesus on the shore, Jesus encouraged them not only to use their fishing skills on the other side of the boat, but Jesus goes on to build up the disciples by a pep talk with Peter when he asks him, Peter, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Tend my lamb. The disciples have these God-given gifts to be used to build up the kingdom of God. They just need to change the way they understand those gifts and abilities. Don't be discouraged, but be encouraged. Like the coach says to the team, get out there, play your hardest, be your best self. That's all that matters. So as we think about Paul, as we think about Ananias, as we think about the disciples, and we come against all the change that we are seeing happening around us, our scripture reminds us that instead of thinking of that change as something happening outside of us, maybe God, in fact, is working change in us, like Paul and Ananias, even the disciples. And in that moment, we can't fully understand it, but if we trust that God, in fact, makes all things new, we might discover something about ourselves. As my wife explained to me as I was commiserating about all the change taking place in our lives, she simply said, he has never steered us wrong. Amen.
gathered together with the church around the globe and throughout the centuries. Together, we profess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Set free from the captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church, people in need, and all creation. Each petition ends with God in your mercy, and your responses hear our prayer. Holy One of New Beginnings, fill us with new life. We give thanks today for your Spirit's movement in your church that brought together three Lutheran church bodies to become the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America. As we celebrate 35 years of ministry together, Send us into the world as you sent your disciples to invite people to come and see your wondrous acts in Christ Jesus. Continue to inspire us in our work together as Trinity and St. Timothy to be one church. God in your mercy. Holy God, accompany laborers who get little rest from their work. Give them hope when they struggle to produce what they need. Give all who labor fair treatment and just wages, which value each individual for their gifts and talents. God of mercy, be with those who are suffering from persecution and war. Our hearts yearn for a peaceful resolve to the war in the Ukraine. Speak to all leaders. Soften hearts to seek and to end the violence, and the loss of human life. Bring needed relief for those that are caught in the crossfire, those seeking refuge in bordering countries. Give courage to those who are working on the front lines, giving much needed care for those wounded and hurting. God, in your mercy. Holy God, restore all people who cry to you for help those we name aloud or in our hearts. Turn their mourning into dancing, their pain into healing. Clothe them with joy and put a testimony of strength and praise on their lips. God, in your mercy. Loving God, we rejoice in all our relationships in our homes, in our neighborhoods, among family and friends. Bless Rick and Nancy Proskow as they celebrate their marriage of 50 years. May your goodness continue to guide and enrich their lives of commitment and love. May all our relationships be a reflection of mutual support and encouragement. God in your mercy. Faithful God, in the waters of baptism, you claim us as your own. We celebrate with Calvin Stangland as he receives his first communion. Shower him with your grace and love as you come to him in this holy sacrament. We give you thanks for parents and mentors who encourage each of us in our walk of faith. God in your mercy. God of wisdom, we give you thanks for all of those college and university students wrapping up years of study and exams. We give you thanks for all those who graduate and step forth into the career path you have for them. As you promise, change happens, and you promise to bring joy and goodness in that change as we walk with you. God, in your mercy. Holy God, join our voices with angels, creatures, and all the saints in praising Christ 
and bestowing upon him all blessing and honor and glory. Comfort the family of Carol Holman, sister of Esther Watson. Reveal Christ's glory to us and through us in our worship. God, in your mercy. In your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. The peace of Christ be with you always. We share that peace with one another. Seated as we gather our gifts. All God's people said, Amen. Hey, if you want your morning workout, you need to join the bell choir. She gives them a workout. <clears throat> I invite the congregation to please rise as together we prepare to feast on the meal our Lord places before us. The Lord be with you. 
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb, who gave himself away for our sin, who in dying has destroyed death, and in his rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with the earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed are you, O God of the universe. Your mercy is everlasting, and your faithfulness endures from age to age. Praise to you for creating the heavens and the earth. Praise to you for saving the earth from the waters of the flood. Praise to you for bringing your Israelites safely through the sea. Praise for, to you for leading your people through the wilderness to the land of milk and honey. Praise to you for the words and deeds of Jesus, your anointed one. Praise to you for the death and resurrection of Christ. Praise to you for your spirit poured out on the nations. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of, of me. With this bread and cup, we remember the Lord's Passover from death into life. O God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Reveal yourself to us in the breaking of the bread. Raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us. Send us forth, burning with justice, peace, and love. With all your holy ones of all times and all places, with the earth and all its creatures, with the sun and the moon and the stars, we praise you, O God, blessed and holy trinity, now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the gift of the Spirit, together we pray with the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forever. Amen. I invite you to take time to read through your announcements and see what's happening in the life of our congregation. I remind you that two weeks from today, on May 15th, we are having a congregational meeting. We will be voting on the merger with St. Timothy, so we hope that you will make plans to be here that Sunday and join us for the meeting. A reminder that we do have a book exchange table out there and puzzles to keep your mind good and active and to help you share what you've enjoyed with others. I invite you to please rise and receive our Lord's blessing. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join in singing. Christ is risen. Christ is risen Go in peace. Tell what God has done.